In this lesson, we'll be discussing the Wittig reaction. This reaction produces alkenes from carbonyl compounds and this type of compound, which is called a phosphonium illid. Before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit more about the nature of this compound. Phosphorus is neutral when it has three or five bonds, and here we have a bond to three phenyl rings, so these are just benzene rings hanging off of this, and then we have two bonds to a carbon, so we're at five bonds, and phosphorus is neutral in this resonance form. Here we're double bonded to a carbon, so carbon has one, two, three bonds and an implied hydrogen, so four bonds, and everything looks neutral in this form but we can draw a resonance structure where we push electrons onto the carbon atom and produce this charge separated form. Here I've abbreviated the triphenylphosphine piece, but now we can count phosphorus still has three phenyl groups on it, three benzene rings, and one bond now in this resonance form coming to the carbon, so it now has four bonds one less than it would want to have when neutral, the five bonds, and so phosphorus is positive in this resonance form. And since we push these electrons onto carbon, carbon has a negative charge. And this form will give a lot of insight into the reactivity when we look at the mechanism. Now you may not be all that familiar with phosphorus compounds yet, so let's just take a look at how we can make these. Conveniently, we can start from familiar alkyl halides. So I'm using the bromide here, but the chloride, anything really with a leaving group that can undergo an SN2 reaction is going to be a good candidate for this starting point. Now we can treat this with neutral triphenylphosphine. Triphenylphosphine attacks at this carbon here, and in an SN2 reaction displaces this bromine. Now we're very close to making our illid, However, this carbon is not yet an anion. Well, now having this positively charged phosphorus adjacent to this carbon makes these protons quite acidic. We have a strong inductive effect, pulling electrons toward this positive charge in this bond. This makes these hydrogens much more acidic. And so we treat this with a relatively strong base, perhaps sodium terbutoxide. This deprotonation generates our illid, which we can represent with this charge separated form, or as this neutral resonance form. This reacts with carbonyl compounds producing alkenes. Since we've already shown the arrow pushing for this SN2 reaction, let's start here. Sodium can be regarded as a spectator ion, so we only need to show the terbutoxide portion to show the deprotonation of this acidic proton. Now, I'm going to leave the illid in this charge separated form to show you the rationale for why it attacks the carbonyl the way it does. We'll align this so that the oxygen and phosphorus are close to each other, lined up in this way. This is because of the dipole in a carbonyl compound. We have this great dipole here, pulling electron density toward the oxygen and away from the carbon. The oxygen is delta minus, the carbon is delta plus, we can even draw a charge separated resonance form for this as well. But drawing our compound in this way aligns the negative charge near the delta positive carbon. And now we can show our electrons attacking the carbonyl carbon, pushing the electrons up onto oxygen. This attack step gives this. I want to point out, even though this mechanism looks really new because you have elements that maybe you haven't seen before, this attack is similar to a Grignard attacking a carbonyl. So we just have this negative carbon attacking at the carbonyl carbon and pushing the electrons up. Now we have something kind of unique, but if we think about this, we just have a negative here and a positive here. There's an electrostatic attraction, and if oxygen makes two bonds, if it shares the electrons, it'll be neutral. And if phosphorus accepts a pair of electrons and makes five bonds, it will be neutral. So now we can show the electrons from the oxygen attacking at phosphorus. This is going to make a four-membered ring. And this four-membered ring intermediate is called an oxyphosphatane. The next step is going to give our alkene directly.
And so we can draw two arrows within this ring, breaking the ring to form our alkene and the product that I haven't drawn up here, which is going to be triphenylphosphine oxide. So we can show our arrow pushing like this and arrive at our final products of the reaction. Now, although this step, the fragmentation of this ring here, might be really new to you, I want to encourage you to think about the steps that you do know and apply concepts from things that you've seen before. Here, we have deprotonation of an acidic proton driven by an inductive effect of a positive charge right next door. Here, we have carbonyl attack by a negative carbon like a Grignard. Then we have this snapping down because we have a positive and negative charge that can neutralize themselves. So this is really the only new step that you'll need to learn here. But as long as you keep in mind what the final product is, you should be able to draw those two arrows. There are important stereochemical considerations in the Wittig reaction as well. We first show this reaction with a ketone. And this is symmetrically substituted on both sides. So it doesn't matter if we draw the alkene going this way or this way, it's the same product. But what if we have an aldehyde here instead? Now since we only have one group on the phosphonium ilid and one group on the aldehyde, these need to be either on the same side of the alkene, Z, or they need to produce the E alkene and be on opposite sides. The major product of this Wittig reaction is the Z alkene. Now this ilid is called an unstabilized ilid. And I'll show you why in just a second. That will produce the Z alkene as the major product. But there are certain substrates that actually favor the E isomer in a Wittig reaction. Let's look at an example, the mechanism, and see why they're different. If we treat this alpha halo ketone with triphenylphosphine, the SN2 reaction will proceed very smoothly. These are great substrates for SN2 reactions. Now we'll deprotonate to make our ilid. And now, of course, we can draw this, push our electrons in to make the neutral form of our phosphonium ilid. But we should notice something else about this anion here. It's basically an enolate in this case. It's alpha to a carbonyl which can stabilize this by resonance. So our arrow pushing looks like this. We get this additional resonance form. And we'll find that whenever we have an anion stabilizing group like this adjacent to the carb anion of the ilid, we're actually going to favor the E isomers of these alkenes. Now let's take this stabilized ilid and react it with this compound. And I am going to show you the whole mechanism because I want to show you an alternative way that you may see it written. We'll use this resonance form because it's the most convenient. And we'll line this up in the same way, put the oxygen near the phosphorus atom. Now these steps can be abbreviated into one step, so in some representations you may not see the betaine intermediate. We can do this by drawing two arrows here instead of one. So instead of showing our intermediate with the negative charge on oxygen, we're going to skip straight to the oxophosphatane. Now we can show the oxophosphatane breaking apart. So when predicting the major product of the Wittig reaction, we need to look at the phosphonium ilid that's formed. This one has no additional resonance except for the resonance that represents this as the neutral form or the charge separated form. This here has actually three resonance forms. We could push this way to show the neutral form, but we can also push in the other direction toward this anion stabilizing group. Now, the reason for this difference is not completely understood. However, it of course has to do with molecular orbital theory because of the way the molecular orbitals are interacting. It is reasonable to assume in this unstabilized ilid that these two groups will actually approach perpendicular to each other. And in that transition state, if we position the large groups further away from each other, that will predict the Z outcome of this product. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video for today. 
but through this video, I hope you're able to see when an ILID is unstabilized or stabilized and be able to predict whether the Z or E alkene will be the major product of your reaction. KP here. If you learned something, give me a thumbs up on the way out. And for more chemistry, subscribe to my channel.